Screen Time Stories is presented by Pinwheel. With Pinwheel, you get to set limits on your child's smartphone to match their maturity level. As your child grows, you can open up more features to guide their independence. There are many options that come with a Pinwheel smartphone, like allowing approved contacts only, remotely monitoring messages, selecting expert vetted apps based on professional guidance, and the scheduling mode to keep your kids living in the moment. Connect authentically with a Pinwheel smartphone for kids and teens. For a 10% discount, use code PODCAST10 at checkout. Today I'm talking with Andrea Davis, who is the founder and CEO of Better Screen Time. She is a certified digital wellness educator and has a background in education. She's also a mom to five kids. Andrea, thank you so much for joining me. Tell us a bit about yourself. Yeah, so my name is Andrea Davis and I am a mom of five. So our oldest just turned 18 a few months ago and then our youngest is eight. We have four girls and one boy. And years ago, I was the parent that put the TV in the closet. So my husband and I had a conversation and basically I was talking to a friend one day and she was a really amazing reader. And I said, Rachel, what did your parents do to instill this love of reading in you? And she said, oh, we didn't have a TV growing up. And so I was like, really? And I, I just was curious. So I went home and I told my husband, Tyler, he's not really into sports. I know this would not be an easy sell in other people's houses, <laughs> yeah. but he was like, totally fine. Let's put this. So we put the TV in the closet and we would pull it out for family movie night for the Olympics and that kind of thing. And I love that. Like we spent many, many years just really doing other things that we love to do, going to the library, riding bikes, spending time outside, playing games, reading books, all those things. And then, um, you know, fast forward years later, our family had a big cross country move. We moved from Illinois to Oregon where we now live. And our oldest was in middle school at the time. And we handed over an abandoned smartphone to her because she was leaving all these friends behind. We all know that middle school would not be a fun time to move. And those friends were starting to get phones. Yeah. And then in this place that we moved, I didn't know anyone. And so I really felt like I wanted to be able to get a hold of her or I wanted her to be able to call me if she didn't know where to get off the bus, any of those things. And so we just had it, had an abandoned smartphone. We handed it over to her and then months passed and she came home from school one day. And I still remember she was eating her bowl of cereal with one hand. And then she was doing this with the other, she was scrolling. And I thought, wait, where did my kid go? And where did those conversations go that we used to have about, Hey, how was your day? And I could just see that this was interfering a few months after that. I was scrolling on my own phone in the kitchen and I came across a social media post for my daughter and it frightened me. She was lip syncing the words to a song about a Glock, about a gun and pointing her hand to her head, making this gun motion. And that pulled a trigger inside of me. I was like, okay, we're done. Yeah. We're done at this phone. And so it was at that point, my husband and I had a conversation decided that we needed a major reset and we invited her to, or we just told her we're going to say goodbye to this phone for a while. And we went back to a brick phone, yeah, <laughs> uh, which was not fun for her. It was not fun for us, but it was one of the smartest decisions, decisions I made as a parent. And I just told her, you know, we weren't prepared and basically we failed you. We, we didn't prepare you. We didn't prepare ourselves. And it was at that point that I realized that parents needed more help with this important decision. And especially because parents are dealing with all kinds of chaos. It might not be a move for them. It might be something else big going on in their lives. And then they may not quite understand or grasp fully the responsibility, the weight of this decision of handing over a phone. And that was what prompted me to start Better Screen Time. That's awesome. And I love it that you were able to have that moment where you owned up 
to your mistake and said, mm -hmm. I recognize that I should not have done this. I, I mean, like that's part of parenting to make mistakes. We're human. And um, I just really love it that you were able to talk with her, help her understand where you are coming from. Like, oh, you know, you're my oldest child. We thought this was a good idea. It is not a good idea. We're going to mm -hmm. <laughs> reverse. Um, yes. I'm curious because this is so, so, so common. Like people, parents getting, parents giving their um, kids their old hand-me-down smartphone is super, super common. And it's, mm -hmm. you know, fully unlocked and open. And there's not really any regulations that, um, make these things kid friendly or, you know, protect them from adult content. And so it's like, it's so, I'm so excited to talk to you about the difference between how your experience was with scaling back your daughter, your oldest daughter, versus you have these four other kids that I'm assuming you introduced them to tech in a different way. Like, so you kind of have this like <laughs> this um you know control group almost yeah no exactly well first of all it's important to remember that six years ago when that happened it safe phones available right there was no pinwheel mm -hmm. nothing like that apple didn't even have screen time at that point so you know, anybody listening you have to think back like this was a different era it really was yeah. the wild west of the smartphone. So there's so many more great options today, which makes it so much easier and, and we utilize and talk about. But when we had to make that change initially, we actually did sit our all of our family down together and we started talking about just the pros and cons of tech in general. So we had our kids, we made a list together and we said, okay, thumbs up what are the things that we love about tech? And we wrote this big, we had a big post-it paper. We wrote all the things down that we loved about technology. And then we said, okay, thumbs down. What are the things that we need to watch out for? Mm -hmm. And so again, the kids made a long list and this was super powerful exercise because it helped our kids learn this skill of discernment that tech is not necessarily all good or all bad, that actually has both and that we, as human beings have to use this skill of discernment to be able to distinguish between the two. And it's a skill that doesn't, we don't build overnight. It happens over time, right? So we initially did that. And then we moved to creating a family tech plan. We talked about, you know, where are we going to use screens? When will you, we use them? Because not only was it this phone, but schools were starting to send home devices mm -hmm. a little bit more as well. So that life that I lived with the TV in the closet was a glorious time, but that, that period was gone. <laughs> it was done for two reasons. One tech had changed and had, was becoming so much more a part of life and school. And second, my kids were getting older. Right. And so that requires a new approach for all of us. So we made that family tech plan. And then we just built into these series of conversations, which I actually put in a discussion guide that we have on Amazon. It's called creating a tech healthy family. But one of those discussions is just called, am I ready? And we asked the kids uh, two questions. Again, we had our big post-it paper out. This was a different night, different conversation. And I said, number one, what does it mean to be responsible? And number two, what does it mean to be emotionally mature? And mm -hmm. With younger kids, you might have to unpack that last question a little bit, but they, they knew what we meant. So the kids were like, okay, well, if you're responsible, you get up for school on time on your own, you do your chores without being asked, you take care of your belongings and you don't lose things. And they said, if you're emotionally mature, you're kind to your siblings and you don't throw a fit when you don't get your way. So we, again, we made this long list. And at the end of that, I told the kids, I said, yes. And those are the things that a person needs to be able to do for they're ready for their own smartphone. And the kids were like, oh, <laughs> and uh, at that point we, because I used to be a teacher before I stayed home with my kids, I actually turned that into a self-evaluation so that parents can give this to their kids when they start asking for a phone and yeah. the kids can actually self-evaluate like how am i doing in these areas and sometimes parents will say 
well, what do I do if my kid just lies on all these questions? Then I'm like, then that's your answer, right? That they're not ready for a phone if they can't be honest about this. And so we, that's a tool that we use and that we share at Better Screen Time for parents. But we also kind of came up with these smartphone stair steps. Again, this was prior to any kids safe phones being available. And I just told the kids, okay, we're going to take this one step at a time. We've gotten, got this four phase process where we start with something really basic. We have no internet access. And then we're stepping up to adding things a little bit at a time, which I know aligns really well with, with Pinwell. But again, those things didn't exist when I laid this out for my kids. I'm like, we're going to take this really slow. So with my, you know, to answer your question with my younger kids, it's been far easier because number one, they understand what the expectation is, right? And two, they've been warned of a lot of the dangers and it's a, an ongoing conversation that we continue to have. And then also that precedent is there where they know we've told them, we gave this phone to your oldest sister too soon. We learned the hard way. She had to be the guinea pig. And so we know better now. And so they definitely have not been as like pushy about getting phones earlier because they just know this is, this is a process. We're taking it slow. Yeah. I love that collaborative approach on that you're taking with all of your kids. That's very cool. Um, so tell me more about better screen time. How did that, it sounds like this is the the impetus where everything was, (laughs) it was starting to grow on this pros and cons board without you even knowing it. But tell me about, yeah, like, I just felt, well, there seemed to be kind of a one size fits all solution out there where it was very much just get us, use a cell phone contract and put on a monitoring app. And that just didn't sit well with me. My husband's an engineer. I'm a teacher. We both really like to understand processes and why, and our kids are very much the same. And so I thought, you know, I really want them to build that internal filter and have this conversation. So again, my background is in teaching. And so I kind of just pulled that, you know, training that I had of child development of what I had learned from being a teacher and also just being a mother of five and kind of pulled that that background and expertise along with what I was learning as I started reading books and really experimenting with the kids and felt that there was a lot more to this conversation than just a cell phone contract and a monitoring app that instead um, that we needed to teach our kids. And now I'm so grateful. You know, I've been doing this for better screen time has been around for almost five years now. We'll be have five years in July. And my oldest has gone through a lot of changes since then. I mean, she is going to college <laughs> this year. And I am so grateful that we, you know, that we paused, that we took the time to take this slowly. And now she's to a point where she does have an iPhone that's still quite restricted. And then, you know, my other kids are using some of the kids safe phone options that are out there. And so that's been a really great stepping stone. But my goal really is to help parents worry less about tech and connect more with their kids. I love that. Because again, I think it's that relationship that's going to save you and save your kid when it comes down to this because these devices really can become a wedge in a relationship in a home in a family and to me that's one of the most damaging parts actually i mean there are a lot of things we have to be careful of but we don't want to lose our kids right and we don't want to lose that relationship with them and it's not worth it it's not worth losing a relationship over a smartphone yeah um but it takes effort So when you talk about this self-evaluation where you're figuring out the levels of emotional maturity and responsibility, it sounds like you almost need to start before you start collaborating with your kiddo, you almost need to just start with yourself and ask, like, is my relationship in a good enough place to even consider this, you know, doing the self-evaluation with my kid to see if if they're ready for a smartphone, like, are we ready for this thing to come into our relationship? Yeah, you're spot on. Like there's preparation on the part of a parent 
as far as you, what conversations have we had, but also am I investing in this relationship with my child yeah. that we're at a place where we can have these hard conversations about really tough topics, yeah. like things like pornography and online predators and all the things that we all worry about, right? As parents, those are some tough conversations to have. And it takes time perhaps for our children to want to open up about those things, especially once they become teenagers, but they are listening, but we really do have to invest in that relationship first. But I'm wondering if part of this conversation of talking about getting kids their first smartphone is actually taking technology out of the equation altogether and just saying like, how are we doing? Like, what are our expectations in general? So we have two online courses. One's called Creating a Tech Healthy Family. And we really help like parents with like ages five to 13, where you're having these conversations, you're introducing topics that are tricky and you're creating this family tech plan so that everybody's kind of on the same page. But our second course is called Untangling Teens in Tech. And it is a little different approach where it is rather than the whole family, it's a one-on-one -on -one approach with a parent and a teenager. And the very first thing that we do in that course is we work on the relationship. We build a relationship with our teenager. Yeah. So we just did a live version of this a couple of months ago. And the parents went and did these one-on-one -on -one dates with their teenagers. And one of the most fascinating things is that as time passes and they actually do more, we call them, you know, teen tech talks later in the course and they get to that, quite often parents will tell me, you know, we started talking about um, like persuasive design or the social dilemma. Maybe we watch the social dilemma together or something like that. We started talking about that, but then after it got over and the conversation continued, my teenager actually opened up to me about a whole other slew of things that I didn't even know was going on and things that were happening. And so again, I think it's, we're taking the time to invest in the relationship, but also, you know, we're teaching and training, but it's amazing how if we are available and make time for that, that, it, it is tech is just exactly as you said, it's just one piece of the puzzle. And if other things in our teens life are feeling really out of balance, whether that's their sleep or friendships, um, physical activity, any of those things that make us feel human and feel alive and, and feel in balance, if those things are out of place, quite often it will manifest itself through their tech use. Yeah. And because maybe they're lonely, maybe they are escaping to their device for that reason, or, you know, it's a, there are a myriad of other reasons yeah. why they do, but yeah, it is, it's all just connected for sure. Well, and it makes me think about how kids approach their phone differently or, you know, any kind of, you know, tablet or laptop or whatever. Um, they, they just have a different relationship with it than I had growing up because I didn't have a smartphone. Um, and so it's just interesting to think about them using their tech for like the reasons you stated, but then also using it for, you know, just daily life. This is, they're living in a totally different era and for them to be able to like, my kids are on spring break right now. And I was like, I want you to text three friends, <laughs> see, see what everybody's up to today. And I stood yeah. there and I was like, okay, who else are you going to text? Okay. Who else are you going to text? Like, it's really pretty outside. Can go, you know, meet at the park and play basketball or something. I'm yes. like, like, let's use this in a positive way. And so, you know, like better screen time. I just think that name is adorable because I, I you're not um villainizing technology in any way it's like we can use it to to make things better but it's just I like I recognize that it's hard for parents it's hard for me to see technology the way that our kids see it you know the way that they're interacting with it just because it's it's so different than what we grew up with 
Yeah, it really is. And, you know, I still remember Julie, like sitting in the kitchen, not long after we'd taken away the smartphone and having a really hard conversation with my daughter. And I just got done reading the book, iGen. And I was sharing some of the statistics with her and the, the data that had been found and how this generation is changing, a lot of it due to technology. I was feeling pretty pessimistic about it all. And by the time I got done and shared, saying all the things I wanted to say, you know, my daughter looked at me and she just said, mom, I feel like you're saying our generation is doomed. <laughs> and that, oh yeah. And that like all these bad things are going to happen. And I honestly had like this aha moment where I thought, is that what we want our kids to, to take away and to believe? Because you become what, what people tell you and what, yeah. what you believe. Right. And so it's, I mean, I still am in many ways, very, we try to be very low tech. I still, we very are pretty minimal with screens, but they have become a part of our daily life. And that was a part of my reason of calling it better screen time. It's, I thought, no, I want my kids to know that I believe in them, that they can get to a point where they use technology as a tool, Yeah. but we just have to take this very slowly and all kids are different too. And that's why it's, you can't really say like, okay, at age 14, they're ready for a phone because they are all just in such different places, right? Yeah. And every family is different. Yeah. So that's why I think it's so important for parents to like, look at your kid, but like, let's have some confidence in this generation. They just, yeah. they need a lot of guidance. And we have that wisdom on our side of having not grown up this way. And I think they need that. But also they are an important part of this conversation because exactly as you said, they, they're growing up in a very different world than, than we grew up in. And I think from our perspective, it's so easy to become hyper-focused on technology because it's that new element. Like we don't have the role modeling and stuff to go off of. We're kind of creating it. And so going back to this, you know, tech being a puzzle piece, I think that it's really important. Like, let me know what you think. But I feel like if we're looking at technology as just a puzzle piece, it's really important to like recognize that sometimes I get hyper focused on just the tech piece of it. And, mm -hmm. you know, you're saying like your kid might be talking about an interaction they had online and then they start talking about all these other things because for them it's just one piece of their lifestyle for me I'm like oh you've got like all these different platforms that you're on and everything's changing all the time but I think it's really important for me to like take a step back not be so hyper focused on that component of technology like as a little island. <laughs> yeah. It's like, it's just, it's part of what they're doing on a daily basis. Yeah. Well, and I feel like every parent, you know, when they listen to something like this, they'll know what they need to do. Because I think sometimes parents, you know, when I go speak, I was at speaking at an event a few weeks ago and one dad texted his wife during the event, she came up and told me, and he was like, we need to check our kids' phones. <laughs> Oh. You know, and that was like the, that was like his gut feeling that he got while I was talking that that was what he needed to do. Yeah. And so I think it's just important. Like there are these, we have these gut impressions as parents that like, maybe I need to scale back or maybe I need to do this. And, um, the important thing is, is that we are, that it is a part of our conversation that we're staying on top of it, but we, it, is, it can be tricky, like walking that middle line. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So when we're thinking about a kid that has never had a phone before and, you know, we went through that list of the self-evaluation and we feel that this might be, this might be the time, <laughs> what do you advise people to do next? Yeah. Well, definitely starting with a kid's safe phone, like pinwheel, I think it's worth so much, uh, you know, because a lot of parents are like, well, I have this leftover phone and I'll just use that. Mm -hmm. But I believe in something called tech 
creep, kind of like lifestyle creep, where it's like the more you have, the more you want something. And I think it's really nice to be able to curb that appetite for social media with a kid's safe phone. That social media really is one of the biggest dangers facing our kids when it comes to technology. So the longer you can keep that from out of their lives, the better. Um, and so just, yeah, starting with something very simple, you having it be a family phone. So even if they are like, okay, I can do all these things, start with it being a family phone, not their phone. So yeah. it's something that they get to use because a lot of us don't have landlines anymore. Right. Mm -hmm. And so that is like, you're having your son's, your son texts his friends, same thing. Like they do still need that connection with other people. And so that's a way for them to connect and then make sure you're creating that family tech plan. I always tell parents like one of my non-negotiables is keeping screens out of bedrooms and bathrooms. And so if they're using that phone, it needs to be used in a shared space where other people are available. It doesn't go into bedrooms or bathrooms. It's just a great habit. Even if you feel like, oh, well, this is a safe phone. They can't do anything on it. Well, at some point they'll have a full blown phone with everything. And so it's just like any habit. If you start early, it, it gets easier. Can and I practice that too in my home. Can you tell me so what? I, yeah, can you tell me why you say shared spaces only? Yeah, so quite often when kids are getting into trouble online, they're usually in using screens in isolation. So they're in a bedroom or they're in a bathroom where no one else is. So this danger could be pornography. It could be online predators, like people that they're communicating with that are strangers that they don't know. They might be, there's also just a lot more chance that they would take an inappropriate picture, like a nude. Obviously, if the phone never goes into a place like that, they're much less likely to take a picture like that, right? Mm -hmm. And I always tell my kids, if you never take the picture, it can't get sent. So just don't ever take the picture, right? Yeah. And so um, that keeps them safe that way. And it also keeps them from wasting time, which is also a big thing. And I, when I go speak and I talk to parents and, and kids, I say, you know, this is such a special time in your life when your brain is going through this pruning process. And it's basically deciding what it's going to hang on to and what it will let go of. And which means it's really awesome because you can learn things very quickly, much more quickly than I can. So you want to take advantage of this prime state that your brain is in, right? But if you're just like wasting time mm -hmm. scrolling social media, just gaming for hours and hours, watching YouTube, you're like, you're missing out on one of the prime parts of your life and yeah. being able to learn a language or play the piano or dribble a basketball, whatever that is. And so I think that's the other danger is just, um, that and and then i had a mom tell me she said okay we finally instituted your like no screens in the bedrooms in the bathrooms she said my teenage son was like furious <laughs> he was so mad um but he did a lot of video editing and she said he's now been doing that out in the front oh. room and he still often has his headphones on but she said i've noticed he just has a better temperament and he is less moody and he's interacting with us more yeah so again you're like it's just there's so much to do on a screen it never ends right everything's yeah. available 24 7 so if you take a teenager on a screen in a bedroom you might not see them till the next day right yeah i mean we so don't even that's like another thing we don't even have to be talking about teenagers it can be you know yes. ourselves we can start going down this news rabbit hole and it's so depressing some days and yeah then we're just you know dark cloud but there's nothing we can do about it and so um yeah not like I can totally understand where that teenager is coming from um what other tips do you have for when your child when you're thinking about getting a child their first phone like what other um steps would you put in place yeah so in our course on tangling teens in tech we walk parents through this process of just creating a plan with their teen and you might call it a pledge or, you know, you could call it whatever you want, but it's just essentially a plan that's for them. 
So what we do is we actually ask our teens to list their values. I give them like a sheet that has a whole list of values. They'll go through and like, I'll say, okay, circle five. Like I want to know what your top five values are. And then we'll have them write a value statement. So it's basically a one liner where they're saying how they plan to live their values. And that's both offline and online, like as a person. And then our goal is to like help encourage them to live those values when they are using a device. So that for us has worked much better than a cell phone contract because again, I want this to be an internal, like this intrinsic motivation. And I think like we can't always start there because intellectually and developmentally our kids aren't quite to that point. And that's why we do this more when our kids start to become teenagers. I mean, really about middle school can start to help them articulate their values in it. And they start to figure out what those are over time, right? With our younger kids, that's a little harder, but that's why we still do this collaborative plan so that they still are contributing. They're a part of it. They helped come up with the, the consequences and those things, because again, they're seeing things a little bit more black and white at that age developmentally. Um, but But yeah, as our kids get older, definitely letting them kind of come up with this. This is your plan for using your device. And that family tech plan still holds true as well. So it's not like then suddenly they don't have to follow what everybody else is doing. You have that foundation. And then this is that second layer and you're preparing them to leave home. Right. And so as I'm watching my oldest and we, those restrictions are just slowly coming off. We're working to where they'll, they'll be completely off really in a couple of months and she'll be here for the summer and she'll go to college. But our, the way we can are continuing to support her is just by asking what kind of accountability do you need? Because even college students are struggling yeah. with, with their phones. And so how can we help you be accountable? So again, it's just a slow release, right? Yeah. Of and helping them know that even as adults, we need accountability partners with our devices. So it's not, you know, they're, they're built, they're designed to keep us hooked. Right. Yeah. And so we all need just some of those parameters, whether you're using the screen time features on your phone or whatever that is. And that's and another thing I love about the pinwheel is the, the different modes and features that you have to set up you know, times of day and those kind of things. It's baby stepping into yeah. that, right? Well, it is like in the effort of avoiding that displacement where, you know, instead of sleeping right now, I could be texting a friend. And texting a friend in any other circumstance is really great. And, you know, you're connecting with another human being, but you need to sleep. <laughs> you need to go to bed. <laughs> yeah. Totally. Yes. Yeah, exactly. And they eventually have to figure that on, out on their own. And that's why that, that exercise of helping them identify their values I love and, that. Um, and building them up. That's so beautiful to not only celebrate and illuminate your kids' strengths, but then like, I'm also having some major vision board vibes right now like (laughs) make it something really pretty and put that on the wall and when they're having a low moment or you know feeling insecure they can look up at the board and say like oh my grandma thinks I'm you know good at violin or my best friend thinks that I'm kind or funny or something yes I'm glad you said that because that's actually what I have my kids do really Uh, yeah not a vision board necessarily but yeah create something and my daughter put it on her as her wallpaper on her phone for a long time like the background yeah and so I thought oh then she'll see that every time she goes to use it and think okay and just, again, it's a reminder to make good choices, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, it, it builds confidence in the right direction. Yes, I love, I love that. Yeah. Yes. Okay, is there anything else that you want to tell me about kiddos first phones? I think just taking it really slow. I'm yeah. a big advocate of that. Um, so my oldest is 18. She has an iPhone, but still has restrictions on it. 
And um, yeah, we're slowly working out of those. And then I have a ninth grader and an eighth grader that still use kids safe phones. Yeah. And I know that for some people, they're like, that's crazy. Cause a lot of kids by that point have an iPhone or have something else, but it's just been so good for my kids. Um, they can still connect with their friends. They have very limited other options on there. And then I have a sixth grader who doesn't have a device. And, um, you know, if, if he needs to message somebody, we have like a kid safe watch that has 10 numbers. So it's kind of yeah. like our house phone. Like a landline. Uh, yeah, exactly. It's our landline. And that's worked really well for us. So I think just taking it really, really slow and there are huge benefits. And to remember that you might get some pushback and that pushback is normal. But I heard this quote long ago from um, Dr. Dimitri Christakis, and I, I love it. He says, to pick your battles wisely and then win them. Mm. <laughs> and when I go speak to parents, I always share that. And that, that's kind of where I'm at, where there's a few of those that we need to, those tech I guess, boundaries that we have to pick yeah. and decide what our non-negotiables are, but then also teach and like love our kids as, as we're going along. And I was at the high school a few weeks ago and one of the uh, people that work there, she just said, oh, your daughter just is so confident. She just seems so self-confident. And she said, do you think because you waited on social media, do you think that helped? And I was like, 100%. Hmm. I mean, you're seeing all these headlines about the hard things that teenagers are going through, but in particular, teenage girls and yeah. oh, social media definitely plays into that. So I think just holding off on, on those things as long as you can, it, you'll see huge benefits and rewards in your kids. I they'll, think, they'll struggle a lot less, I promise. Yeah, and I think that hearing from somebody that confidence is a trait they noticed in your kid is like maybe the highest praise because, you know, there's kids that are smart and pretty and funny and they're all, you know, different. They're great in their own way, but I, I think that having confidence means that your kid knows who they are they're comfortable yes. in their own skin and they're ready to go out and do life. I just feel like that's such a great compliment to, you know, put my mom heart at peace. <laughs> like, okay, yeah. she's got this. <laughs> totally. Yeah. Well, and it's funny that you use those words because my daughter was just recently writing all of her college essays and she asked me to edit them. And I didn't know going into it, like, what, when am I going to read? What yeah. did she write about? And I get to one and she shares this whole experience about us putting the TV in the closet, about the move and the phone and going back to the future phone and feeling these feelings of isolation and feeling um, different and left out. And then, but by the time you get to the end of the essay, you know, she said, while well, my classmates were being fed body image issues from TV and social media, I was taking ballet classes that taught me to love my body. And she said, I, you know, I know who I am. That was basically, her last line was exactly what you said. And, uh. you know, it doesn't mean like, oh, she's perfect or that she's set for life or you know I think that's a continual process for all of us but I think to get to that point and at least feel like no I know I know who I am and I know where I'm headed that's what we want for our kids yeah. right yeah and we don't want technology to to interfere with that it's not worth it right yeah yeah okay I gotta go but thank you so much for your time today this was incredible Thank you. Thanks for having me. I'm glad we finally connected. Yeah, me too. And <laughs> I would love to talk to your daughter sometime too. She sounds awesome. <laughs> yeah, she might be willing to do a podcast if you like. Heck yeah. Okay, well, thank you so much again. And everybody listening today, um, just remember, it's not about being perfect. It's just about being good enough. <laughs>